after we were done filming, I went to one of the vendors and I was trying to negotiate on some tchotchke, you know, like beads or something. Sure. And the salesperson looks down and he looks at me and he's like, really, you're trying to negotiate? I was like, yeah, he's like, you're wearing a double red sea dweller and so you're trying to negotiate. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. the watch can kill the deal. Well, I was impressed that he could spot it. I was like, you know your watches? He's like, that one I know. Josh Bernstein, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Talking Watches. My pleasure. You've been described as an archaeologist, a TV show host, an educator, mm -hmm. uh, a survival expert. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could kind of just tell me about the arc of your career and see how you see yourself. I would say I, I identify as an explorer, uh, an educator, a storyteller. Those are the top three words I pick. I've been fortunate to have done a lot of travels as part of my work in television. I get the fun job of being the person that's put into places that audience would want to watch and tune in to see what happens next. Hi, I'm Josh Bernstein. You're watching Digging for the Truth on the History Channel. And so this very, you know, very interesting career path has taken you all over the world mm -hmm. and a lot of the times with watches. And it looks like you started really well. If we're following yeah, the chronological order, we have this beautiful Cartier tank. That was a gift from my parents when I graduated from college. And to be honest, it's a beautiful watch. You know, it's, it's sort of the classic gentleman's formal wear piece. It was my entree into fine timepieces. So mm -hmm. I'm grateful to my parents for, for introducing me to more than just the Casios or Seikos that I was wearing at the time. But I will be honest, it doesn't get as much use as the other ones because these are sportier and more compatible with my lifestyle. And then as I got into television in my 30s and started getting placed into very, um, say, risky situations, I realized that it might make sense to have the emergency. Production is going really off the rails if you have to pull the cord on that. But just knowing that I had that beacon gave me some peace of mind. I mean, the Breitling emergency is one of the rare places, I will say, where this hardcore gear yeah. and a high-end Swiss watch brand really yeah. intersect in such a meaningful way. And so just seeing one here in person is so cool. I have to note, was there ever a point in the course of filming an episode or yeah. being out on an expedition where you really thought, geez, I might have to use this thing? There were, there, were, there were certainly plenty of conversations with the crew because they all knew that I had it. Yep. And they would make jokes that like, we're gonna you know, pull the cord on it while you're sleeping. But I was like, guys, it's, first of all, it's like $10,000 <laughs> if you do that, which I wasn't willing to pay for. There were some tight moments. There was one in particular in the Alps when I was doing a show for History Channel. It came close, but nothing, thank God. <laughs> thank God, so far. That's good to know. And then this one, this one was uh, another Breitling that was my stepfather's. Mm -hmm. And he wore this watch. He passed away a few years ago. I was having a seance, a medium-driven mm -hmm. evening with a bunch of people here in New York. I, I was a guest, but, but this woman said, is there someone in the room who blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, that's, you know, that's be me. She's like, I'm getting a, a George. And oh. I was like, wait, that's my stepfather. He just passed away. He's telling me that he, he wants to know where his watch is. And so I said, I'm pretty sure my mom has it. And, he wants you to wear it. He wants you to wear it right now because he wants to be connected to your pulse. Oh, wow. And so I said to my mom, I'm like, you know that, that Breitling that, that George had, could I possibly have it? And so I wear that when I want a little bit of energy from my, from my stepfather. And so in the course of, you know, wearing these watches, uh, we'll say mainly the Rolex watches, mm -hmm. you've gravitated toward, you know, brand new watches, which you bought at retail. And then you've also purchased vintage watches at auction. Yeah. What appeals to you about, you know, the modern watch and what appeals to you about the vintage watch? The provenance of vintage watches, if there's one that's like special. I love that this, this piece, because it does rest on, on your wrist and does connect, as I said, to your pulse, there is a certain intimacy with a timepiece. I don't have my watches engraved with anything about me on them, but I know other people do, and I kind of love connecting to that. Yes. This is why I wear my, you know, my stepfather's watch, because it allows me to connect with him. And you don't get that with new pieces. But at the same time, if you go to Basel World and you're like, you know, that's, there's some amazing watches where people can sort of reinvent the timepiece. And so, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm conflicted, or I guess I, I take both paths at the same time. Vintage is where my heart lies for the history of the piece, and then modern watches for the sort of innovation of them. And so following, uh, you know, your, your Cartier and a couple of Breitlings and then a Panerai, which you wore a lot on TV, mm -hmm. now we get into some Rolex. So my dad wore a Rolex 
I think it was a day date, but it was something that I was like, hmm, it's a lot of flash. Yeah. And, um, and so that was always my like hesitation. I wasn't into bling. I was more into like, I have a mission, I want to wear a watch, this serves the purpose. But then through my relationship at the Explorers Club, which I'm a fellow and been a proud member of since 2004, I ended up meeting a number of people at Rolex, including Alan Brill. And as president of Rolex Watch USA, he was curious. I mean, we, we had a very good relationship, mostly because we would sit together at dinners for the Explorers Club and he'd be like, you know, Josh, why, what's with the Panerai? Or Josh, what's with the Bright Lake? <laughs> why aren't you wearing a Rolex? And I was like, well, you know, my dad wore a Rolex, but I don't really have a sense of the brand. And Alan was kind enough to invite me into the headquarters here in New York and gave me a tour of the building. And at that point, I had a deeper affection for the degree of expertise and specialization that Rolex has, the, the machining every single part and meeting people who'd been there 20, 30 years and were like so proud of their ability to create these timepieces. And so I was like, okay, Alan, like, let's talk. And so I, I discussed with him, like what's an appropriate first, as he put it, first Rolex, ever the salesman. And it came down to a GMT and a Sea Dweller. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved the sort of bare bones, no Cyclops lens style of the Sea Dweller. And so that was my first Rolex. It's a tool watch, it's a sports watch, yeah. and it's really a perfect entree into the world of Rolex yeah. sports watches. Yeah, and as a diver, it was perfect for me. The helium escape valve is a little bit beyond. I'm a fairly proficient diver, and so I get into some mixed gases. But at that point, I was like, I just love the style of it. And then after the Sea Dweller, this is where you really start to kind of take off as a Rolex collector. I remember I was in uh, Utah at a trade show for the outdoors, and there was a Rolex dealer there. And so I went in, and I was just curious what, what they had. And he had this watch, which was, at that point, the 50th anniversary Submariner. The Kermit. The Kermit, yeah, the Kermit. And I, I love green. It's always been one of my favorite colors. And I remember thinking, like, as much as I love Submariners, this is a special moment in Submariner history. Mm -hmm. So I reached out to Alan. I was like, hey, there's this you know, 50th anniversary edition. And he's like, those are hard to get. Mm -hmm. like, even for us, that's hard to get. Just buy it. So I bought it. I mean, the Kermit is a total classic. This is a watch that people are still kind of uh, vying for in the collecting yeah. community. They yeah. absolutely love the Kermit. So that was number two. And uh, the floodgates were open. At that point, then, I think number three was this, the, the white-faced stainless Daytona, which, again, collectible. This is yeah. really, this is the original hot steel sports watch for yeah. Rolex. And I remember I was at Fortain Jewelers uh, in Carmel and Josh Boniface there. Yeah. He had this for me, thankfully. But he was like, this is not even something that most people can, can yeah. walk in and get. I wear this these days mostly for very elegant affairs. It's not my daily wear, but I love it every time. It has a, such a distinct look. And I've actually closed business deals with people because they're wearing either the Daytona or the Sea Dweller. Oh, really? Yeah, I'll be like, again, I like, you look at their shoes, you figure, but if they're wearing a, a Rolex that says something, mm -hmm. and if they're wearing this, you know, Daytona or a Sea Dweller, I'm like, okay, we have a similar Some aesthetic. kind of simpatico or yeah, something. Some yeah, some sort of simpatico, exactly. Yeah. And then the watch after this, which I have since sold, but acquired, um, acquired at auction was my most collectible watch, and that was a double red Sea Dweller. Wow. 1973 with original papers, yeah. Mark II. And, and that one, that was like an investment, you know? Mm -hmm. that, was a big, that was a big leap for me. And I wore it for a number of years. I actually had Rolex service it. It pressure tested, and they were amazed that I was wearing it on my explorations. And like, they were like, you're, you're diving with this? And I was like, yeah, it's made for diving. They're like, this is a vintage collectible mm -hmm. that there is no other crystal for it. Like this crystal's pressure tested, but if it breaks, there isn't one in the system. So you lost a watch at that point. So I sent a picture while I was diving at like 130 feet saying oh, like, gosh. here it is. And I went <laughs> Rolex is like, what are you talking about? But, but the spirit of the watch is exploration sure. and is diving. So I was adamant about using it in the field as much as I could until at one point I was doing a show in Ephesus in Turkey. After we were done filming, I went to one of the vendors. They sell like these little kiosks. Mm -hmm. and, and I was trying to negotiate on some tchotchke, you know, like beads or something. Sure. And the salesperson looks down and he looks at me. He's like, really? You're trying to negotiate? I was like, yeah, <laughs> like, you're wearing a double red sea dweller. And so you're trying to negotiate. <laughs> sometimes the watch can kill the deal. Well, I was impressed that he could spot it. I was like, you know your watches? He's like, that one I know. I was yeah. like, I should, mental note, don't, don't wear this when you're trying to negotiate because it was like having a, a small car on your wrist yeah. in terms of its value. Sure. But yeah, I loved that watch. And, and then I sold it to another collector at the right time. What makes this really strange is that the access point to this underground labyrinth is in the back of a store that sells vegetables and fruit. It's just an average store. There's nothing special about it, and yet, it's got a staircase that goes underground. 
in all of the television that you've made, yeah. are there any you know explorations or excavations or any episodes that you would like to revisit that you where you think that you could continue digging and, and learn more about yeah. um, certain discoveries? Yes, uh, oddly, that's come up recently. So when I was making shows for History and Discovery, we were in a different era of TV, and the pendulum swung into a reality phase, and the pendulum seems to be swinging back. There's a few places I'd like to go. I've been fortunate to have gone to about 80 countries at this wow. point, but that leaves about 140, depending on your counting, left to do. And so it's a combination of going to new places and then going back to old places with new eyes. What's interesting is that the pursuit of exploration, right? Like how we go about bringing new knowledge into the world, especially in the scientific community, began, I think, initially with astronomy and then geography and the ability to go to the ends of the earth and map them. And you can't do that without a, a very strong understanding of where you are on the planet and what time it is. Like it's meaningless if you just go there and don't know how long it took you. You can't do any kind of mapping. So, so the timepiece becomes a critical tool for explorers. And, so, and the ability to have greater accuracy and to have a clamshell that's waterproof. I mean, the ability to say this is not going to ruin your expedition because it'll survive even if you don't. Yep. Uh, and then the stories of, of timepieces that happen, like Colonel uh, Percy Fawcett, and his like, the only thing that survived from him was his, his timepiece. And so you have these wonderful stories of explorers and their timepieces that sort of transcends the practical equipment list. It's like, this is part of me, and it's gonna contribute to my success. 